So, why is it we're not doing better? Resistance. You said resistance. Here's our common response. By the way, every change will have resistance. On some campuses, if we told them, we're going to pay you today, they would resist. Okay? Even if we said, we're going to pay you extra today, they would resist. Okay? One person said, the only human being who is for change is that baby with a dirty diaper. <laughs> okay? So how do we, who are supposed to be moving change along, how do we react to change? Let me tell you what I have seen over and over in engineering education. A common reaction to those who don't get it. We dismiss them as idiots, right? They just don't really understand the crisis at hand. They really don't understand the data that are presented. They may be great you know, mechanical engineers, but clearly they don't understand social science data, educational research data, and that kind of They're just idiots, OK? We'll move on. We won't pay attention to them. Now, the other common response I have seen, I think we're particularly skilled at this as engineers, is what's called bulldozing, OK? You don't understand what I just said, so I'm going to say it again louder. <laughs> right? You didn't understand the 27 slides showing the data that I just showed you. Okay? You didn't understand this, so I'm going to show you 57 slides. And that, of course, will make you understand better. What we rarely do in response to the resistance is say, let's talk so I understand. What we rarely do is anticipate that when I go in this room to try to show them where we're headed and what we want to change, I anticipate that they are going to be resistant. And I do not try to position myself to, to sell a proposal or an idea or a solution. People, you know, you hear all the time in the change literature, get buy-in. You're in trouble when you have to go sell it when you're talking about real change. They have to build it themselves, and I think this is truer of engineers than maybe any other profession. This, you know, when I heard, first heard NIH, I didn't know it was an agency. I thought it was not invented here. It was a syndrome that everybody understood, okay? So there is an aspect that we need to understand that people need to understand the need but derive their own solution. And if you don't go to talk to them until you already are trying to sell the solution to, you're going to have a horrible time trying to get the change to actually happen on your own campus, much less trying to get the change to happen on another campus. But you say, they invited me to come and talk about this wonderful experiment that we were doing at my home institution. So I was supposed to go and talk to them. But I didn't frame the talk nor use my personality, nor use my energy to help them understand their need. I used my entire energy to sell them on how good I was, and my team was, and what great things we did, right? And when we talk about the reward system, most of us don't really want a brand new reward system. We want the entire system, but weighted different. What I do now should be weighted more. Right? I have a colleague who's been at my university for a long time. He's in the National Academy of Engineers. He is an awesome researcher. He's a distinguished professor on our campus. It's a big deal. It's a small number of faculty that achieve that rank. And you achieve it because of your research. I will tell you, as an electrical engineering professor, he is also one of the top teachers in the department. He wins lots of awards. And as a young professor, when I came in, he was one of the best mentors for teaching and research. He's the kind of guy that opens doors for you and then gets out of the way. That's a mentor, OK? And he tells a story of some decades back when, he, when we were trying to become more research active, when the predominantly teaching faculty around him punished him, held rewards out from him because he was too active in research. 
He surely couldn't be teaching enough if he was that active in research. Why I tell that story? Now on my campus, everybody says, oh, all they reward is research. Okay? But it wasn't always that way. It was the institution wanting to make a shift, and they rewarded one dimension more than another. And many of us in this room are arguing for the exact same thing. We're not asking for a balance. We're asking for them to reward us for what we do, not reward everybody in a balanced fashion. If we really want to complain about the reward system, be sure we're not just saying, hey, you're ignoring me. I want you to pay attention to me. It needs to be a bigger shift than that. So Meyer, Rick Meyer, talks about the levels of resistance. Have you ever thought about what the resistance is? He, he talks about it in three levels. There's cognitive resistance. They just don't understand the idea. Misinformation, missing information, conflicting data that we have to resolve. Most of us assume that the resistance is cognitive. There is, of course, emotional resistance. In faculty meetings, we hide that, typically. We talk about the cognitive problems, the idea the data that's missing, some process that wasn't followed, something like that. But it may be that we feel undervalued, taken advantage of, isolated. We're going to lose respect if we do it your way. We distrust what you've done. Or we really don't have the incentive to make the move. It's emotional. It's not that we don't understand the data that you've given, but it's an emotional change. Or then, of course, there is that deeply embedded resistance, usually historical. You need to know about this. There are some people who will resist anything I say. Not necessarily logical in my mind, but it's me. And if my team doesn't understand that and they keep putting me in front to say this thing, we're going to have some people resistant just because the message came from me or just because of some historical perspective of where I was and what stance I took. You've got to find the right level of resistance you're dealing with. So let's talk about cognitive resistance. How many of you have read the book, Mistakes Were Made But Not By Me? That's a real book, isn't it? I thought it was a pretty good book. It talks a lot about cognitive dissonance. Most of them, many of you understand cognitive dissonance. It also talks about confirmation bias. Information that's consonant with our belief, we accept. Information that's not consonant with our pre-held belief, something's wrong with it, right? So cognitively, when you put this data up that says, I haven't been teaching as well as I thought I had, I've been teaching for near 20, 30 years. I've gotten teaching awards. I've introduced lots of new things, new courses, new aspects in the curriculum. When you put up data that says, I'm not teaching well, I don't hear it. It doesn't fit my belief. If you were telling me that you think as well as I'm teaching, maybe I could teach better, I might hear you. But if you're telling me I'm teaching wrong and I'm not teaching well, guess what? Don't hear you. That's a confirmation bias. Your data is wrong. It's flawed all before we even look at it even further. They've done scans of the brain, and they find that the reasoning area of the brain, visually, in the scanning, shut down when confronted with dissonant information. Reasoning is not, so while you pound away at the data, explaining it to all kinds of links so that they will fully understand it, guess what? All reasoning is shut off. Okay? What they have found is that the emotional areas those areas of the brain that most connect to emotional areas, lights up when consonance is restored. How do we restore consonance? I'll tell you how they do it on my campus. When somebody, many of the people come to talk about engineering education, presenting data on what they've learned and what they know, they get discounted because they're not the good faculty. They're not active. 
as scholars. So as soon as I get some resolution that, oh, I don't have to listen to your message because you're not that good at engineering faculty, then I'm emotionally feeling better, but I'm still not reasoning about the data that you're giving me. So, Jerry Johnson says, when you're thinking about the emotional level, so that was a cognitive level, Jerry Johnson has this exercise for you to do. Let's say you just did a presentation for your department. And a very senior colleague walks up and said, you did not do that very well. That's all. Now, there's a spectrum of ways you can take that con comment. But some people, and I'm going to ask you to raise your hand in a little bit, may take it as constructive, positive. Some people would take it as negative. In your environment, would you take it positive? Somebody said, you did not do that very well. A few? Would you take it negative? Does it mostly depend on who the person was as to whether you would take it positive or negative? Not the environment so much, but maybe who the person was. Let me give you another one. The same person says, I hope you do that better next time. <laughs> was that a threat or was that encouragement? <laughs> How many see it as a threat? How many see it as encouragement? So how can the exact same words have such different meaning for people? It's the paradigm you're in. It's what you're visualizing. Maybe the person and the paradigm you have with that person. But that's a paradigm. And so the words I tell you to try to encourage you to change, same words one person's going to see as encouragement. Another person's going to see as a threat. How many of you really watch for and try to understand how what you're saying is being interpreted? When I was an assistant professor and I said something in a departmental meeting, I'm not sure many people heard it, but I'm pretty positive nobody thought it was threatening. As a vice provost, when I come to my departmental meetings and say something, it gets interpreted in a whole different way than it had ever been interpreted before. And if I'm not aware of that, how many of you have had department heads who were on the faculty, they were equal, and then suddenly they become a department head, and when they say something, it becomes threatening or a mandate instead of just a colleague who was, had an idea or was saying something. We have to pay attention to the paradigm we're in and understanding the emotions we're evoking with those different paradigms. And then let's talk about those historical kind of resistance. Edgar Sheen says, the culture of a group is a pattern of shared basic assumptions that the group learned as it solved problems. And those solutions have worked well enough to be considered valid. And so they teach those processes, procedures, ideas, framing to new members as the correct way to perceive, think, and feel. He talks about we have artifacts, data we can show, espoused values, what we claim we're about, and we have these deep assumptions. Those are set historical. When you come to change the culture of a department, you're messing with their historical setting. If you think it's just cognitive, then you don't understand change at all. You're going to be at their cognitive, their emotional, and their historical level if you're trying to do a major change for many departments in engineering education. Edgar Sheen then goes on to say, you cannot create a new culture. So give it up. He says, you can immerse yourself in studying the culture until you understand it. Then you can propose new values, introduce new ways of doing things, and articulate new governing ideas. Over time, these actions will set a stage for new behavior if 
the people who adopt the new behavior feel it helps them, the organi organizational culture may embody a different set of assumptions and thus a different culture in the future. If the people who adopt the new behavior feel it helps them, the organizational culture may change. How many of you spend time talking about the innovation you've done in engineering education, making sure everybody knows how much harder you're working than ever before? Is that motivation to adopt your way? You have invited me to go from something that's working to something that may have an improvement, but it takes a whole, whole lot more work. I'm not highly motivated by that. I'm not feeling that this is a good trade-off and that it's going to help the underlying assumptions of the organization. In my experience on my campus where we spent a lot of time looking at, before it was common, active learning, technology in the classroom, uh, studio type learning environments, integrated, getting physics, math, English, chemistry, engineering, all to work together. Experiments that y'all are doing on many campuses now. We did this in the 90s. Got it adopted for three-fourths of the 1,600 students we take into freshman engineering every year. And the guys who did this never missed an opportunity to talk about how hard it was. <laughs> Guess what happened when the money from outside sources was gone? Gone. Took eight plus years to get it in, took it less than two years to go out. As soon as the external driver, that external money, was not there to justify how hard this was. Now, it is my belief that once you got over the transition of learning this new way of doing something, it was no harder than the other ways. It was the transition that was hard. But we spent so much time making sure that our colleagues knew we were working as hard as they were, that we killed ourselves. We killed our ideas. It's very important to recognize that when you're winning, if you're not careful about how you're setting up things, you're destining the progress to go backwards. So, organizational change, this is Osborne and plastic, is not a science. Oh, darn. I wanted it to be. Culture is too per pervasive and too complex. It is based on non-conscious mental context and varying levels of cohesiveness. What does that mean? Most of us don't have a clue what our departmental culture is. We just really have never thought about it. We can think about the artifacts, and we can think about the espoused value. Let me give you an example. Tell me the university in the United States that does not espouse that it's for diversity. Right. We all espouse we're for diversity. How diverse are some of our campuses? The artifacts don't show a lot of diversity. The espouse value Leave no doubt, we're for it. Why is it there's this disconnect? Because the underlying assumptions say we're for it as long as it doesn't mess these things up, whatever these things are. You know, US News and World Report kind of cares what the average SAT score is. So we can't mess those things up, right? We have to reject a lot of people, because that's what the rankings say we're supposed to do. So there's a lot of reasons. But we don't spend a lot of time talking about and looking at the culture when our artifacts don't match our espoused value. Okay? We say we want to be great engineering educators in departments, but we don't really look. You guys who are there espousing that they should do more to change this, do you really look at what is the culture that's preventing this? I know it's the reward system. I know you talk about the reward system. But what else is driving that reward system? Have you looked at the state of universities? I know some of you were talking last night. Your state institution gets 7% of its budget from the state. Where's the other money coming from? It's not all tuition and fees. 
if department heads and administrators and leaders weren't pushing for some of those other evil research dollars, this ship would not be what it is. Some of you are at well-known and prestigious institutions who want to be more prestigious. What is the game to be more prestigious? Graduating more undergraduates? No. And least you say, well, we should not worry about that. And I know some institutions are solely focused on undergraduates, and that's great. But for many of us, what we know is the way we get more and better undergraduates is really what we do with the graduate and the research program. We get more applicants to Texas A&M University because we're considered prestigious, nationally ranked, not because they're looking for just an undergraduate experience. We have great regional campuses that do a great job at the undergraduate experience. And they are clamoring for more students. And we are having to reject thousands of students every year. Now, I can tell you that's silly. But it is reality. So the regional campuses who are doing great undergraduate programs want PhDs, want their faculty who are teaching a full load of teaching like nobody on my campus has to teach to also get research funding, to also publish in the same sort of places that my campuses do. Why do they want to do that? They want to be financially secure. It's not just that they'll get the research money, it means that students will clamor to enroll in those schools and they won't have to be working quite so hard to get enrollment where they want. So when we judge them as you should not do that because it's all about the educational experience, we're not paying attention to the culture that those entities are really operating in. That doesn't mean we have to give up. We just have to be aware. One of the things that Osborne and Pastic talk about is you have to establish a vision if you want to change. What is the vision for your campus when you want to change? You have to get people to let go of the past. Many of you are really adept at telling people, let go of the past, but you're not telling them where to go. This is like getting somebody up on a trapeze and telling them to let go. But they can't see that there's anybody over there to catch them. Where are we going to land when I let go? Or I see somebody over there. He looks to be about 12 years old. And I'm certain he's not going to be able to catch me when I come over. I don't have the trust that this is going to work. So you have to work better constantly, over and over again, on your vision. You have to establish that you can be trusted. Definition of trust. An expectation about the positive actions of other people without being able to influence or monitor the outcome. How many of you exhibit trust? Because it's not easy to trust somebody who won't show me trust. They also point out, Rita Oberon, that there's different levels of trust. There's cooperation, which means I trust you temporarily. There's participation. It may evolve from instinct to cooperation. I listen and I offer to cooperate, but I'm participating. There's involvement. According to their definition, is I'm giving myself on the basis of cognitive and emotional terms. And then there's commitment. When involvement becomes intrinsic and persistently renewable, trust that is not commitment won't help you do major change. John Cotter said the biggest error in trying to motivate change is we do not create an appropriate sense of urgency. But he goes to great lengths in his most recent book, A Sense of Urgency, imagine that, to say it's not just that we don't make the problem seem urgent, it's sometimes we make it seem artificially urgent. He talks about a lot of people who are running around trying to create a lot of anxiety about the doom that is about to happen. That artificial sense of urgency does more damage to your change cause because it's not real. 
when you come and tell most of my colleagues that we're about to fail in engineering education because we don't do some pedagogical approach, and our students still get hired, 97% of them, by the day of graduation, I'm having a hard time hearing you. It may be true that we have an urgent need to start a change, but my artificial sense of urgency that doom is about to befall us is not being helpful in this problem. What he says is we have urgency not being high enough or complacency not low enough. And the more successful you are, the more complacent you are. If it's been working, then I'm pretty complacent about it. So Olin can be pretty complacent. They've been innovated. They will keep being innovated. But they will not make certain changes because they can be complacent with the success they've had. University of Illinois, incredibly successful as an engineering institution. WPI, I mean, I'm looking around, Arizona State, lots of institutions here, incredibly good. Mississippi State, you're here. All of these things are incredibly good at producing engineers. That complacency is not low enough because it's worked so far. Cotter says we have to get a real sense of urgent, urgency. And Thomas Sowell says the problem, the fundamental question about decisions, is we keep telling people what to decide. And if we're real change agents, we should only be talking about who and the process that they're going to use to decide. It's great when your charge is to do an experiment and see if something works with education. It's great if your charge is to take care of these 50 or 100 students and you do it the best you can. But if you want to be a change agent, quit trying to sell your idea. Talk about who needs to be considering this and what process they need to be to consider it. If it's the right who's, they will be smart enough for the system you're trying to change to see a lot of white, what need to be done. They will find you. They will see what you've already done. But if you don't have the right who's involved in the discussion, you will never get it done. On my campus, we met all the time with the disgruntled faculty who didn't like the reward system. The more we met with the department heads, the more we understood. You know what they wanted to see if we were going to make engineering education a valid scholarly area? Quality publications. Funding from external sources and graduate student production. We could do all those things if we quit griping about how they weren't appreciating what I did in my classroom when I never published anywhere but a conference presentation and they're looking for journal publications at my institution. And by the way, the department heads didn't care if it was an engineering journal. It was fine if it was a high-quality education journal. But we didn't talk to them about it. We just assumed they were against us. So the model I would tell you you have to do is you have to recognize if you're going to change something that some people right now today are totally ignorant that anything is going on and anything needs to be changed. Some people are aware that there is something going on but they haven't really gotten engaged. Some people are interested in what's going on, but they haven't really decided what it means. Some people are in the process of deciding, is this a good or a bad thing? And some people are committed. I suspect you're here because you're committed. You cannot ignore that the information you need next is totally different than the information that the person who is ignorant that there's even anything going on needs. You have to attack change at all levels at once. 15-page articles do not get the ignorant person engaged. They're not the least bit interested in spending their energy reading a 15-page article if they didn't even know an issue was going on. Boring lectures. Not going to get them. Lots of data. Not going to get them. I have to have something for every stage. And I learned this because industry came and talked to us as educators about how they 
have understood and create materials for every level of change that needs to go on in the organization. So as you plan your change, I'm coming close to finish, let me remind you that you have to be strategic thinkers, not tactical. And if all you can think of is the tactic, if all you can think of is this is how I'm going to make this student feel better this day, that's a wonderful thing, but it's not strategic. So you have to change to be much more strategic in your thinking about how you're going to motivate major change, not just how you're going to prove something can be done a different way. So not pretending this is war, but having you given you already lots of information about Texas and our mentality on weapons and blowing up the university and things like that, I thought it might be useful to you to think about the terrain that the art of war talks about when you're deciding what your strategy would be. So they talk about nine terrains. Dissolution, that's a, ter a terrain. What does that mean? It's not really terrain, but it has to do with the situation and the environment. There's infighting. How many of you are trying to motivate change by them and we can't get the in group to quit st fighting with each other? The suggestion in the art of war is if there's a lot of infighting, don't go into the battle because they'll run. Your colleagues will run. As soon as there's opposition, they're going to say, well, no, we never meant that. They'll undercut your data. Don't go in if there's infighting. If it's a light incursion, meaning that if there's a lot of opposition, we can get out real easy, then don't, don't pretend it's going to be a deep one. Go ready to go in, make your light incursion, and then get out. Okay. If you approach a light incursion as if it's deep, then when you tick everybody off, you'll be the only one standing there because they turned around and they got out of it too fast. Okay. If it's contentious, it means that there's all kinds of natural hurdles. The registrar is a hurdle everywhere, you know. Not really okay for all the registrars that might be here, but I don't know. They're a special breed, you know. The room assignment person, the timing, you know, we had a hard time on our campus because Monday, Wednesday, Friday classes meet for 50 minutes. No matter what the educational advantage is to meeting for an hour and a half or more, no, couldn't change it. We had to do all kinds of things for that. So if you have contention, you got to build trust. You know how we built trust with the registrar? We promised we would fill the room up with as many people if he let us change his schedule than if we stuck to his schedule. He had a set of criteria that we didn't have, but we could meet his criteria. If it's traffic, everybody comes this way, then make sure you don't get cut off. All right? If it's intersecting, it's where three things come together, research, teaching, service, whatever the intersections are, then you got to align yourself with the other parts. You can't be against them. Too many people talk about research as if it's a bad thing. It's not a bad thing. We just want to balance. But it's not a bad thing. And if you talk about it like it is a bad thing, then you're not aligning yourself to the system. Heavy. OK, you're going to go in and you're going to go for it all. Well, then plunder and take all their food. <laughs> don't, don't give them, take over the curriculum committee, take over the awards committee, take over everything. Because if you're not ready and you try to go in too deep to change too much, you will fail because they got all the food. All right? It's a bad situation. OK, what does that mean? It just means even your friends are going to oppose you, OK? <laughs> I hate to tell you, but the best recommendation from the art of war is leave. <laughs> if you have passion and it's getting ab absolutely squashed where you are, find another place, OK? If you're surrounded, surprise them, OK? Do something totally unusual. And if you know, without any doubt, that you are about to die, fight quick. <laughs> OK? 
I think as you plan for change, it might be very useful to keep those important aspects in mind because many of us claim we're planning, but we never thought about the situational terrain that we were about to go into. And we did not really prepare for what we were about to do. Also, recognize whether what you're trying to do can be authenticated like science. There are some things we know because they've been authenticated. Facts. Some things are false, and we can prove they're false. But some things are the way they are because of our consensus, our emotions, and our traditions. And you never change those with authentication. Consensus, emotions, and traditions are not changed by a proof. So many of your pilot efforts, if you really wanted change to happen in a major way, are not useful efforts unless they're completely entertaining to you. Okay? Culture is a result of daily conversations. Don't have these conversations just when you meet with this group. It has to be with everybody. Not to the a level of being totally annoying because you have no other dimensions besides this thing. Okay? That would go back to the personality thing. You know, you're not going to be contagious with your ideas if you're totally annoying. So, in conclusion, I want to tell you two things. First of all, you claim you want to change engineering education. Then recognize you're going to create a storm. If you don't believe that, you don't understand what those words are saying. Engineering education works. It works well, and it's working well around the globe. <clears throat> Can it? Should it? Does it need to be better? Absolutely. But to change it, you're going to create a storm. And an analogy that is made by Peter Russell, when you're faced with a storm that's caused by change, is that you need to be more like a tree. You need to be able to bend when the wind gets too strong. You need to have deep roots in the discipline, across disciplines, in pedagogy, in engineering, and in change. You have to have deep roots so you can withstand the winds, even if you're able to bend to those winds. And you need other trees. And that's part of why you're here today. So some of you may be encouraged, say, yeah, we got this. We'll get this change going right away. Some of you are going to say, I think I'm going to be a tempered radical, stay in my boat, rock it as much as I can there. Let me end with this. It's called the quilter. Sometimes you don't have no control over the way things go. Hell ruins the crops or fire burns you out. And then you're just given so much to work with. That's in life. And you have to do the best you can with what you got. That's what piecing is. The materials is passed on to you or is all you can afford to buy. It's your fate. But the way you put them together is your business. You can put them together any way you like. As change agents, make your quilts beautiful, and you will be contagious. Thank you. <laughs>